It has been 121 days since the first video came out, and I just want to say that I am sincerely blown away by the fact that you guys still think I'm going to finish this series. I'm just kidding. Of course, I'm going to finish this series. You guys have been extremely supportive, so I do want to apologize it took so long and let you know your patience is much appreciated. So without further ado, let's dive right into a long awaited part two of our replication series. In this video, we're going to cover game instances. We're just going to scratch the surface here, but if you manage to understand this piece, you're well on your way to creating the next Fortnite. I'm kidding. We're also going to learn about server authority and when and why the server has authority over certain actors, components or variables. We're going to really understand how this works by learning how to properly replicate sprinting and how to improperly replicate sprinting as well. And then we're going to have a little fun by creating our own anti-speed hack cheat detection system. This is a hidden secret that you won't find anywhere in the UE4 documentation, so stay tuned until the end and uh, you won't regret it. Alright, so launch in real and let's create a third person project with no additional content just to keep our project size small. And we're going to name it Playground since we'll be using it for future lessons and examples. Once the project is created, we'll adjust our screen settings so we can fit two windows nicely side by side. And to do that, click the arrow beside the play button and go to advanced settings. Under window width and height, we can set our width to half of our resolution. My resolution is 1920 by 1080, so I'm going to change the width to half of 1920, which is 960. And I'm going to use the full height, so 1080 for the height. Now if we change our number of players to 2 and then select play in new editor window, this will give us two windows that fit nicely side by side, just like that. Beauty. At this point, we've already created our very first listen server. If you look at the top of the left window, you'll see that it says server, and we know it's a listen server because there's also a player playing on it as well. And on the right side, you'll see that it says client. This client is connected to this server or this other player over here who happens to be the host. By setting our project up this way, we're going to be able to see what the server is seeing when a client does something and what the client sees when the client does something. So let's open up our third person character blueprint. You can find that in content, third person BP, blueprints, third person character. So let's make our character run faster when we press a key. Right click on the blueprint graph and type in left shift. This will give us an input event listener and it basically just listens for the user to press and release the shift key. Using exact key names like this is not the way you want to configure your controls. What you want to do is use input actions and input axes. And that'll be something that I'll be covering in the UE4 basic series when we recreate the third person template whenever I get around to getting that done. Like get out of here. Anyway, so a good practice is to make sure that your event listener is listening and responding properly. We can do that with a simple print string. So we'll create two of them and we'll connect one to the pressed and we'll connect the other one to the released. When pressed, we're just going to say sprint, and when released, we're just going to say walk. Let's hit play and test it, and now you should see the print string as you press and release shift. Notice that when doing it on the left screen, it prints on the server, and when we do it on the right screen, it prints on the client. This is telling us where our code is being run. Even though this is the exact same third person character blueprint, it behaves differently depending on where the code is being called. We'll dive deeper into what's actually happening here later in the video, but for now, let's make our character sprint. So if we look at our third person character blueprint, we can see that it has a main actor as well as some components attached to that actor. One of those components happens to be character movement. You can see that the character movement component has a section called walking and it has a property called max walk speed. If we drag the character movement component onto our graph and drag off of the pin, we can type in max walk speed and see what we can get. Looks like we can either get the value or set it. Let's set it to 1200 on pressed. And then if you just click the node and hit control W, it will duplicate it for you. Connect the character movement to the target. And on released, we're gonna set it to the default, which was 600. Let's test. You'll notice that when we try to sprint on the server, everything works perfectly fine. However, when we try to do it on the client, nothing is happening. Okay, well, why? You can see that the print string is happening on the client side. It works on the server because the server has authority to change the speed, whereas the client does not. So let's ask that question again. Why? Why does the server have authority over changing the speed while the client doesn't? Great questions, guys. The server's job is to serve data or replicate data to all connected clients. The word replication itself means to make a copy of something or reproduce. In our case, when something is said to be replicating, it means that the server is passing some data to a client who's going to be reproducing exactly what's happening on the server, but in their own instance of the game. So back to our original question for the third time, I promise I'm going to answer this time. 
Why does the server have authority over changing the speed but the client doesn't? Well, the answer comes in three parts. Uno, the client can indeed change his own sprint speed. Dos, the server can change the client's speed only if the sprint speed is replicated. Tree, if the actor movement is replicated and the server speed doesn't match with the client speed, then the server wins. Okay, so why does the server win? Well, in order to keep the game fair, we need one true version or copy of the game. These copies of the game are referred to as game instances. Since clients can do whatever they want to their copy of the game, we don't want to perform any important gameplay functions that could give them an unfair advantage over other players. Instead, we do it on the server. That way, if the client says, my sprint speed is 20,000 and I have unlimited health, if these values haven't been set on the server, the server is going to send an update to all connected clients, and it's going to send the true copy of what those values really are. Okay, let me illustrate just to drive this game instance thing home. I really want you guys to get this. So here's our server and our server has its own version of the game running. This is the game instance and this is the one true copy of the game that we care about. So when a client launches their game, they create their own instance of the game. The client then connects to the server and based on the level or map that the server currently has loaded, there is a game mode associated with that level or map. The game mode determines the game rules for that map as well as some default classes to use, such as what pawn or player controller the client should be assigned when they connect to this map. We can see that in our third person game mode that the default pawn class is a third person character blueprint. Based on these rules, the server spawns a third person character for the connected client and the third person character blueprint may have some variables set such as the sprint speed and the walk speed. Then the client spawns their own version of the third person character in his or her own game instance which has its own set of sprint speed and walk speed variables. Remember, these game instances are not the same world. Think of them as parallel universes. So the server world has its own copy of everything and the client world has its own copy of everything. When another client launches their game, the same thing happens. A new game instance is created for that new client. When they connect to the server based on the level and game mode, the server spawns a third person character for that client and sets whatever variables or components exist within the third person character blueprint. Then the client spawns their own copy of the third person character in their own game instance. If we look at the third person character blueprint, we could see that it's set to replicates and the relevant to owner only checkbox is not checked. So the server replicates it to all connected clients. So the server is going to tell Greeny over here that Bluey just joined the server world and that Greeny, in order to reproduce what the server world has, needs to make a copy of Bluey in his or her own little world. Likewise, the server tells Bluey that he or she needs to make a copy of Greeny in his or her own little world. Similarly, just so we can have all the colors, Yellowish Orangey launches their game, a new world is created for them, they connect to the server, the server spawns a third person character, then Yellowish Orangey spawns their own version of the third person character in their own little world, and since the third person character blueprint is set to replicate to all connected clients, the server tells Yellowish Orangey about Bluey and Greeny, and then it also tells Greeny and Bluey about Yellowish Orangey. Did you guys get all that? If not, let me know in the comments and I'll try to explain it better. I don't know how I'm going to do a better job than that awesome illustration that you guys just saw, but I'll give it my best shot. On a serious note though, let me know if you guys actually like these visual illustrations because they're pretty time consuming and if you guys don't find them helpful at all, then I could save myself a lot of effort. But if one person says it helps them, then I guess for the sake of that one person, <laughs> I'm not going to do it for one person. <laughs> Forget that guy. I'm kidding. Of course I'd do it for that one person. Just let me know in the comments if you are that one person. Alright, let's get back to work. So jump back to the playground and hit play. When we try sprinting on the client, you'll notice that there is a stutter. This is an example of the movement being replicated and the client and the server are fighting over the sprint speed and the server is winning. We can see this much better if we go back to our third person character blueprint and we look at our character movement component and we set the starting max walk speed value to something like 20. And if we test again, remember point tree from earlier? If the character movement is replicated and the server sprint speed does not match the client sprint speed, the server wins. So in our case, we've set the max walk speed by default to 20, so a third person character blueprint is being spawned on the server for this client. Then this client is pressing shift to sprint and we're setting the speed to 1200, but we're only doing it on the client side here. We haven't made any changes on the server yet. If you press your tilde key to bring up the console, and if you can't see it, it's probably hidden at the bottom, so just press it again and it'll come down from the top. Type in the following command, p.netshowcorrections space 1. This command helps us visualize corrections that the server makes to the position of the character. 
So if we try to sprint on the client once again, you'll notice that Christmas has arrived early. If you are red, green, colorblind, I apologize. I tried to find a way to change the capsule colors, but I haven't found it yet. What you're actually seeing or not seeing, I guess in that case, is that there's two capsules. One is red and one is green. The red one is in front of the character and the green one is behind him. So I've captured a set of these capsules, and what this basically tells us is the red capsule is the client's game instance, calculating where the client should be based on them pressing their shift key and setting their speed to 1200. The green capsule is the server sending its version of where the client actually is based on the speed that the server has, which is 20 because we never changed it. That was the default we set the max walk speed to. Since movement is being replicated and we know that replicated variables give the server authority, the client's position is corrected and he's moved back to where the green capsule is. Okay, so instead of running the code just on the client, let's send a request to the server telling it that we want to sprint. Right click on your blueprint graph and type in custom event. Custom events give us the ability to run code on the server. Again, this is what's known as an RPC or a remote procedure call. We'll name one SR underscore sprint. And then we'll create another. We can quickly duplicate by hitting control W on this event and it'll give us another one. We'll name this other one SR underscore walk. You'll see some folks use SER as a prefix, but I find that SER brings up other options, whereas SR just brings up your events. And it happens to be one less key to type. And I'm a lazy guy, so logically it makes more sense to use SR. Just saying. This is just my naming convention that I like to use, but I encourage you guys to do the same or come up with your own. But most importantly, keep it consistent because consistency and a little organization early will prevent you from Hulk smashing your project and starting a new one. All right, select the custom events that we just created and we're gonna change the replications property to run on server. You can find that under the details panel here. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna connect our set max walk speed nodes to our new RPCs. Now we need to call these RPCs when the shift key is pressed and released. Right click, type in SR, and oh my goodness, look how easy that looks. Ugh. We'll connect the pressed pin to the SR underscore sprint, and we'll connect the released pin to the SR underscore walk. Hit play. Interesting. My client is running faster, but there's still a stutter. If we take a look at our Christmas decorations again, we could see that the capsules have now swapped positions. The client is pressing his shift key, which sends a message to the server saying, hey, I pressed my shift key. Server says, okay, this means your speed is now 1200. So now every time the server sends an update to the client, he's getting teleported forward because we're not changing the speed on the client side. By default, our max walk speed is still at 20 for our character movement component. So the client is running at 20 speed, and when he gets the update from the server, he gets teleported forward. Keep in mind that other connected clients are not going to see this struggle with this client that doesn't know if he needs to run or walk. The server is just sending them information and they're just replicating that information in their own little world. We can quickly see this in action if we change the number of players to three. And we'll put client one on the very left side and client two will drag over here to the right. So now if I sprint on client one, you could still see that this client is struggling, but on client two's view, He's running perfectly fine because the server is telling client 2 that client 1 is running at 1200 speed. Client 2 does not know that client 1 thinks he's running at 20. Hopefully that makes sense. If not, hit me up and I'll try to explain it better. But for now, we're almost there. So let's fix the stutter. Copy and paste the set max speed nodes and connect them to the client either before the RPC call or after. It doesn't really matter. I'm just going to connect them here before. And then if we hit play, voila, it works great. We're setting the walk speed on the client and then we're setting it on the server as well. So they match and no more fighting. Notice how there's still a correction happening when I toggle sprinting though. This is inevitable because there's always going to be some sort of delay between the request to the server and the response back. If the client is pressing their key, he's sending the request and changing his speed right away on his game instance. But by the time the server sends a response back, it's a couple of milliseconds later. Based on when the server set his speed to run faster, it sends him an update of where his position should be. And that's that minor correction. If you've been following along, you'll notice that when you try to sprint, these minor corrections are not really that noticeable. With that being said, let's take a look at what not to do when calling an RPC from a client to a server. 
let's drag off of the set max walk speed input pin and drop it on the server call. This will create an input where we can pass data from the client to the server. And we'll do the same thing for the walk server call. Let's rename the SR sprint input to sprint speed from client. And we'll rename the SR walk input to walk speed from client. So what's happening here is when our client presses shift, we're setting the max walk speed to 1200. And then we're passing that same value to the SR underscore sprint RPC. And we're doing the same thing when the client releases shift, but with 600 speed instead. And then that gets passed to the SR walk RPC. On the server side, we're just taking those inputs and we're setting the max walk speed on the server. So there's no fighting and everything should work fine just as before. Hit play and test. And there you go. Let's just pretend for a minute though, as hard as it is to believe that our player is not trustworthy and somehow they've managed to change their sprint speed from 1200 to 12 million. Guess what's going to happen? It's going to go right from the client to the server and now you're getting sued by Marvel for copyright infringement because your player is now the Flash. This is why I always tell you to never trust. You know what comes next. Your players. It's not because I have trust issues. Okay, maybe it is, but at least now you can understand why. Let's have some fun with this. Let's allow these values to be passed in. And we're going to create two float variables. One will be called sprint speed and the other one will be called walk speed. Click compile so we're able to set some default values. We're going to set the sprint speed to 1200 and the walk speed will set to 600. I'm going to clean up by disconnecting the float here and grabbing another reference to the character movement component, plug it into the target and move everything over to the right just to give ourselves some extra space. We'll add a branch on our server calls, so hold B and click on your graph. Then drag off of the float pin coming from the client and let's compare it to our default variables by using our equal operator. Connect the boolean output to the branch. If true, we set the speed. Let's make this even more complex by changing the sprint speed and walk speed variables on the client when they press the shift key. So we'll set sprint to 12 million. And we'll set walk to 600,000. And then we're going to pass that value to the character movement components set max walk speed, which is then going to pass it to the server calls. Remember, as soon as this RPC is called, we're on the server version and the server's game instance has its own version of the sprint speed and walk speed variable. And it's still set to 1200 and 600 by default. Oh gosh, not another one. No, oh, I know, I know, it's terrible. But let's visualize what's happening here. We're already familiar with these two game instances that have their own copy of each blueprint. One on the server and one on the client. Client presses his shift key and sets the variables to the new values. Then those variables are passed to our server calls. This sends a request to our server with the client's version of that variable. We compare it to the server's version of that variable. Since the server's version of that variable doesn't match the client's version of that variable, the server should then send a proper response to the client, such as, I don't know, a good old introduction to the big Back to our graph, right click and type in append. And this node simply builds a custom string, but there's a hidden secret that you won't find anywhere in the UE4 documentation. Even Epic doesn't want to let you know about the secret, but I'm going to reveal it because I like you guys. Let's get a reference to self, and we're going to plug that into the A of the append node. And in the B, we're going to type in space deleted by JC two exclamation marks. No more, no less. We'll connect the output pin of the append node to a print string. And then we'll connect the branch false execution pin to the print string. And we'll drag off of self one more time and type in destroy actor. And we'll connect the execution pin from the print string to the destroy actor. Hit play. And now when we try to sprint. John C yeah, I couldn't find it anywhere, so there you go. So let's quickly recap. In this video, you learned about game instances and the importance of having one true version of the game, when and why the server has authority over certain actors, components, or variables, 
how to create and execute RPCs, how to properly and improperly replicate sprinting, and finally, how to take your incorrect replication of sprinting and John Cena proof that. Thanks again for watching guys. If you learned anything today, I need you to smash that like button and John Cena that sub button. And on a scale between you hate puppies and 10, let me know in the comments how many times you laughed while watching this video. I'll see you guys in the next one, but until then, I'm not gonna lie, it may be a very long time. <laughs> Peace!